Ronald Reagan taking a trip to Moscow in 1984. Yeah, damn Russians are everywhere. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so it was, uh, it, but you know, San Francisco is a great, great town. It's such a, such a beautiful, beautiful place. And, um, mm -hmm. and, uh, yeah, you know, the, the thing that I thought was interesting about Giants fans is they're in the world series, right? This happens while I'm there and they're still like giving me evil eye when I walk by with my Dodger hat and it's like, get over it. You people, I, I don't understand why you're so worked up over that. You're in the world series. You should be able and, to yeah. give me anyway. And yeah. like what the third time in six years? Yeah, exactly. So you know, and 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 maybe it's because you weren't the best team in your division, and you know it. Maybe that's why you're you're upset. But whatever, whatever. I'm not bitter. Oh uh, man! Hey Seth, you open this can of worms, buddy. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, but I, I but I, I, do love their city. Sports, I do love their city. I do love their city. I do love their city. Uh, did you see him? Did what? Did you go to the the Walt Disney? I did. I went to the family Disney Family Museum. Museum, which was really cool. Um, and you know, the thing is, I'm such a big Disney nerd. I I pretty much knew everything that I that was on display there. But the um, yeah. so I was sort of like, well, this is really nice and whatever. And then I got to the Disneyland room, and then I was like, mine, my just my head just exploded. So it was it was pretty awesome. Yeah, I really enjoyed it. What, what, tell me what that is, because I don't have a clue. So you're going through the whole museum, and it's like, you know, Walt in, um, you know, Marceline, Missouri growing up, and then Walt going to Kansas City to start uh, Laugh-A-Gram Studio, which was his first endeavor, and it fails. Right. And then he goes to California to be with his brother, and uh, starts the Disney Brothers studio, which turns into the Walt Disney studio, blah, blah, blah. And so it's all very much like, oh, yeah, totally, I get this. You know, there's Snow White. There's, you know, all the movies and everything. And then you get to the, the 50s, you know, in the, in the progression of the museum as you're walking through. And you go through this, this weird uh, tunnel that has this gorgeous view of, because it's in the Presidio, right? And you have this, like, this unbelievable postcard view of the Golden Gate. And you come around the corner. And you go into the Disneyland room, which is sort of like that point in Walt's life, because every room is like a stage in his life. And the Disneyland room is like Tomorrowland on steroids. It's like two and a half stories <laughs> tall. It's got this beautiful model of Disneyland. And you're just like, you know, like I said, I'm a nerd. I'm a total Disney nerd. And that was uh, that was so awesome. That part was that part was worth it right there. Yeah. And then, of course, would... he, then he dies. So right after that. Which is I don't sad. think I don't think that's true. He's he's frozen or whatever. Right? <laughs> that's that's the rumor. <laughs> that's the rumor. Um, so the uh, let's talk a little bit about the Avengers trailer before we get to the. Uh, oh, it looks stuff. so good, doesn't it? Oh heck yeah! Uh, it's, it's it awesome. looks it looks so much better than I thought it would, and and I you know I had high expectations, and, and uh, it looks fantastic. It looks the the mood, at least the way that the uh, the, the trader conveys a mood that's a bit, at least to me, was a bit darker. Yeah, totally. Than, than yeah, I mean, it looks it, it's the the feel is very dark to me. Yeah, you know, there's a, there's um, an uh, apocalyptic kind yeah. of uh, feeling around it, and um, which is not what you're. <clears throat> I mean, you know, the the Marvel movies, there's often a lot at stake but um <laughs> yeah <laughs> but this one really feels different you know and, and the, the tone that the, yeah yeah maybe maybe an alternate universe as well as our universe yeah who knows this time. who knows who knows <laughs> and i uh, thought it was uh i thought it was very dc very dc like because it's so much darker than anything it's I've very seen serious yeah yeah we'll see yeah. what happens uh i um I uh, I also I, I kind of dig the uh, the change to the backstory for uh, for Ultron and um, making it sort of Tony Stark's problem as opposed yeah. to uh, you know Pim's, and then um, James Spader you know he just looks wicked awesome. I mean he just sounds good and you know when he comes kind of like oh I just I'm so looking forward to that movie now, which is yeah, I guess when the point of a trailer. The quote from the Pinocchio quote. When yeah. Like, uh, there yeah. are no strings on me. The way he yeah. said it. It's awesome. Yeah. yeah what is the, it? The, March or April? March or April? When it's coming is out? it? I don't know. Hold on. It's 2015, right? It's not, it's not yeah. a, because Superman, Batman cleared out of the entire year, um, which I think is because I think secretly, this is my theory. I think secretly they are filming scenes for the Justice League movie already because there is no way a production yeah. needs a three-year lead time right. or four-year lead time yeah. like yeah. that thing is having. There's yeah. no way. 
It's May 1st, 2015. Yeah. So summer, summer kickoff. Yeah, that's a good time. Yeah. I can't wait. I'm so excited. So excited. <laughs> um, are we here? To, what are we right. talking about, Seth? What, we're talking what, what, about... Um, we don't have your the, little uh, partner in crime. I thought we were going to have your partner in crime for some reason. He's got, uh, he's a, he's a minister and his church is celebrating their, what is it? Like their bicentennial or something crazy. So he's, wow. so, and my wife just walked in. So I saw her. Yeah. Yeah. There she was. That was a very fleeting um, glimpse. Almost a, <laughs> almost a Sasquatchian type. That was, that was, that was just like seeing a Bigfoot right there. <laughs> I don't believe your wife exists cause I couldn't get my camera out in time to take a picture of her. She even had the walk. She did. She had, was that a compliant gate? <laughs> yeah, and then see the, the way the, the way the camera is angled, I couldn't see really the top right. of her head. I just saw her torso, yeah. maybe a slight arm swing, and it was fuzzy. And, yeah, <laughs> why are they always blurry? Why are those wives always blurry? I don't. I'm confused. Um, what we're talking about, we are uh, before we get into what is this? Okay, are we before live? We get yet? Into, are people watching? We, us? We've been live. We've been live, but I'll probably cut out most of this. You know, because right. I'm a stickler. Um, Can you tell how many people are watching? Uh, you know what? It's not right because it always tells me there's... Because <laughs> it says 20 million? <laughs> that can't be. No, it says there's... It, it's never more than like... I think the most I've ever seen was seven, but I've had 30 and 40 people tell me they've watched oh, before, right. so... So it's wrong. Okay. So it's wrong. So we're live um, and recorded then. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. It's all It's all going through. If yeah. I ever um, make another Bigfoot show, I might, I might want to try this. Brian, I'm telling you, though, and I was dead serious when I told you, if you send me... What you need done, I will do it for you and post it. Just so it's, it's, I get you know a show. what I'm waiting for right now. The the the, the next Bigfoot show. Uh, it's all me because I need to write something. I need to write something. It's not about editing. The editing actually is pretty simple. It's uh, I need to um, I need to be smart, and I just haven't had time to to stop and think about it lately. I've been really distracted. So mm. okay. Yeah. Well, I don't I know. know that I forgive you, but I'll, yeah. I'll you know I'll accept it. It's not an excuse. Uh, it's just it's reality. <laughs> okay, uh, I'm Seth Breedlove. This is my show. Uh, one of uh, one of my shows. Sass what? A podcast about Bigfoot. I'm joined today by Brian Brown and Daryl Collier from the NAWAC. Brian has been on the show before. Mm -hmm. Daryl has not. So Daryl, we're going to start with you and uh, ask you to introduce yourself to us and tell us a little about yourself. Uh, well, I, I'm originally from uh, the great state of Texas. I was born in um, Atlanta, Texas, which is just, just up in the northeast corner, um, which is really, as the crow flies, probably 100 miles south, thereabouts of, of the place we now call Area X. So uh, kind of grew up, uh, grew into this, uh, was born into it, really. A lot of stories uh, from my family. Um, you know, graduated high school, went to the United States Air Force. Uh, served in the Air Force for six years, two years in the reserves. Uh, I was um, an airborne Russian linguist. Left the Air Force and, and uh, just entered into the business world. And that's where I've kind of settled for the last couple of decades. Um, and I really happened into this um, uh, just after my interest was rekindled. Uh, I met uh, Alton Higgins. And, and took up the, the search uh, with Alton. Um, got a degree in history, and history is definitely one of my passions, probably as great a passion as anything in my life. And um, so, uh, yeah. and not like uh, Dr. Andrew Sullivan said, the, the study of history um, le leads to critical analysis. So that's, I think people would say, well, how, how is, a, how is a, a history degree even applicable in, in this I think it, it helps with critical analysis and, and that sort of thing. So, and I've been doing this now for more than a decade, um, trying to find this elusive animal. And when I first went into it, I was not at all convinced that it existed. I thought there was a possibility, but I was extremely skeptical. So much so that when I had my first sighting in 2004, um, I, was, I was shocked down to my core. Absolutely could not come to terms with it. It took me several probably the better part of a week to actually come to terms with what I'd seen. And um, now since then, uh, particularly over the last four to five years, uh, that, that particular incident just pales in comparison to uh, a lot of the things I've been involved with and the things I've seen 
um, and we can get into some of those later. But, uh, you know, I, it's like I tell Brian all the time. I mean, it's just anybody really outside of our, of our circle, that is the NAWAC circle, really just can't, I would say very few people can actually truly relate to what, to what we're observing and what we're experiencing. Um, and uh, it, it makes, for me, it makes the stakes even higher. Every, every day, every month, every year that goes by that we, that we are not able to achieve our ultimate objective, it just, you know, it, it, um, it becomes even more crucial, more critical. And, you know, Seth, that the, listening to, to Daryl talk there, it, it reminds me of, of when I first started um, going out in the field with, with uh, members of, of the NAWAC back then. It was called the TBRC. And um, what struck me about them is even though they, they were all completely open to the existence of, of the possibility of the existence of this animal because they were spending an awful lot of free time, an awful lot of free time and effort and money. Um, going out into the field, they had nothing to show for it um, at that point. I think that when I first met Daryl, you had already had your your uh, your initial brief um, encounter, but the um, the the skepticism and the 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 you know what you find in a lot of people in this field is that is that they're really prepared to believe um, in Bigfoot, quote unquote, believe, and and they'll accept almost anything at face value. And what I liked about these guys, to a person, there isn't one person in the group that 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 I'm that this doesn't apply to. They were really hard to impress. And um, I recall the first time I went into Area X, and there were things happening that, to my mind, seemed clearly Bigfoot related. I mean, I'm like sitting there going, like, I, this is hard to believe this is happening, even though relatively speaking now, it, it really wasn't that much compared to what I've experienced since. But even though it was happening, there was this this attitude among people in the group that it was it was dismissed as not being good enough. It wasn't really dismissed, but it it, it wasn't like no one wanted to say like that's a bigfoot, right? That's happening because of a wood ape, right? Which was a term we didn't even use back then. Um, so and and what I what's interesting to me hearing him talk that way now is you know there there are there are those who who think that that we're we now because I'm in the group obviously um, are too willing to accept what's happening around us that 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 we're we're uh we're, we're credulous um and the reality is we've just experienced so much that we 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 no longer need to be as um as we've got the 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 the, the direct um you know personal experience sort of move past that that incredibly um you know a skeptical standpoint we've all, we've many of us have seen them we've experienced them we we we've experienced things that can't be explained any other way so it isn't that people in the group have become less skeptical it's because they've got experiences now that, that, that completely colored and changed their 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 sort of viewpoint on the subject and and that's just that's just experience so i i think it's it, go ahead it was it was a process too right. i mean because because the you know right. the, the organization didn't just dive into this and this was and these things just started happening you know yesterday i mean we we uh, you know, back in 2006, we began a uh, an extensive, uh, comprehensive camera trap project, because at that time we thought there might be some possibility that that really, really good footage videos might perhaps not uh, lead to the to the listing of the species, but would perhaps open some doors that would enable us to, mm -hmm. to do what needed to be done to li get the species listed. Mm -hmm. So we, I mean, we embarked on a five year uh, camera trap project that involved uh, several dozens of expensive, uh, probably the, the best commercially available camera traps that there are on the market. And probably by the time you tally all, all the expenses from the organization and those that some of us spent on a personal level, I mean, we're talking tens of thousands of dollars. Yeah. Forty to fifty to sixty thousand dollars spent on this project, thousands and thousands of photographs taken. We went through that, and that was a five-year project before we even got to where we are to, to where we began these long-term summer projects. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, it was just not something that happened overnight. I mean, this most most of the guys in the organization. I mean, they're seasoned. They've been in this organization for years, and it, we are continually adding new people. But the core. The core, the core of the group, I would say, at least have, you know, a number of years' experience 
Even as we came out of Operation uh, Endurance, the very first long-term um, operation, summer operation, you know, we, we had documented and experienced rocks being thrown at us. We had documented wood knocks. Uh, we had documented um, behavior now that we that we we just accept as being as being wood ape. But but at that time, even then, we were debating uh, whether or not we were we were whether or not they actually used wood knocks, right? Whether or not they actually threw rocks. So anyway, I I, I say that only because uh, you know I, one of the things that I often hear from people who who want to talk about Area X in the group is they say, well, why don't you take a skeptic down there with you? <laughs> I'm like, I'm surrounded by skeptics when I go down there. I mean, I was skeptic when I go down there. There's a Absolutely. difference between pretending like something is not happening because you want to appear um, skeptical versus accepting that what's happening really can't be explained any other way based on your experiences. So anyway, that that's... I just wanted to derail the conversation before it even started. No, you're fine. You're fine. <laughs> Daryl, um, you talked a little bit about... A, your sighting um, is that what got you into the subject in general or talk a little bit about what got you into the subject and then tell us about the first sighting you had the what got me into the subject was uh, just by virtue of where I was from originally it was Northeast Texas which is uh -huh. well Texans affect, affectionately refer to that as the Piney Woods the East Texas the Piney Woods and uh, there 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 have always been sightings uh, when I I mean I remember as a, as a, as a young boy hearing stories from family members, my father, uh, cousins, uh, uh, you know, f friends of the family about uh, encounters. And of course, I mean, where, where, I, where, I was, where I came into this world, we were about six miles from, you know, Falk, Arkansas, the, you know, the famed place from the legend of Boggy Creek. So, I mean, I was sort of born into it. Um, and that really, because my, my father used to tell us stories and that really got me interested as a youth. And it was really not something that, to me, it never occurred to me that it was funny, which is something I, to this day I still have problems with uh, understanding and relating to is why people think there's something funny about the possibility of this unlisted ape in North America. Because to me, as a, as a young kid, it was just something I heard about. Uh, you know, and so I can't relate to that. But when I got a little older, I went to the United States Air Force into the intelligence community and... Uh, uh, that's when I really began to question the stories. And, um, you know, uh, I, I had some disbelief, I guess, some lingering disbelief. And uh, one, one time uh, our mission got uh, delayed and some of us were just, we were just sitting around waiting for a launch time and, you know, talked about everything under the sun and this subject came up. And I just sort of made an off the cuff vow to my, to my fellow crew, crew dogs, my friends that I was, one day I was going to look into it and, you know, uh, get to the bottom of it and just at least, at least for myself, figure out what, what the truth was. Because, you know, in my mind at that time, I thought, well, you know, it seems like to me what you need to do, what someone needs to do is they just need to go out and stay in the woods where these things are supposedly seen for a couple of weeks, 30 days. Uh, I mean, that would be the, that would be the way to start it out. And, and oddly enough, that's kind of where we at, where we are now. But, um, and so that, that really, that that's I made that vow and then I kind of threw it aside and it wasn't until uh, the late 1990s um, I took a trip out west we drove through a wilderness area in New Mexico and kids just started asking me questions out of the blue about if I thought Bigfoot could live in these woods and I really hadn't thought about it much uh, and I started they put that question in my mind and I started thinking about that and I when I got back home I did a search on the internet and and I found a guy's name of uh, Alton Higgins. He had, had written a report called the Washita Project. He's a troublemaker, sir, from that guy. <laughs> and uh, and I, to be quite honest, I thought the whole thing was just a big, uh, a big uh, story, a big uh, fairy tale. And I said, well, if the guy exists, then I should be able to track him down. He's in Oklahoma City, you know. I should be able to find him. So I sort of set out on a mission to find the guy, and ended up calling him at his university, and struck up a friendship, and I joined him and. And then, you know, started looking into this. And it was after that I started investigating eyewitness reports that I had this, this sighting. That's what actually led me to that place down there on, on the Trinity River in southeast Texas. There had been a report from a husband and wife who had claimed to see, who claimed to see one of these things in the middle of the road eating on a carcass. And my wife and I decided to turn it into a, uh, we, went, we went to a baseball game. We decided to turn that into a, just a, a, 
a trip to uh, to look at this area and we drove over there and looked around and got out and and uh, walked down the trail and you know about 200 yards in front of me this thing just sort of did a leap long jump leap across the trail in front of me and it's reddish brown uh, very much orangutan like color uh, I could still see it in my mind's eye it was bent over at the waist like a long jumper and very fast it, it, it landed across the trail did a little skip hop and disappeared into the woods clipped a branch and I ran up there my wife was behind me she was looking down when it went across she didn't see it but she smelled it and she heard it and you know when we got to that spot we could smell it very strong rich smell which now uh, I smell I'm you know it's 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 a common thing for us in area X to smell them and uh, we could hear it running off and um, and you know all these years later when I look back it's just it's classic it's the same sort of, of visual encounters we have had n numerous times in area X very sort of fleeting you know one to two second uh, glimpse of an upright hair covered figure that's quick uh, you know fleet footed and uh, you know has a, has a distinct wild ape like almost horse like smell um, and uh, I mean, that was it and, a and after that I was I was deeply troubled by that because I it was hard for me to believe man I just I kept telling my wife no way there's no way there's no way this th that I saw what I think I saw and you know I guess after several days I just kind of came to terms with it and said that you know I, I saw what I saw and that's and from then on man it became one of my missions in life because there is a species of animal out there that that uh, lots of people are denying lots of people don't want to hear about and for whatever reason and I know that they're there and I, I understand that that sort of certainty and confidence disturbs some people, mm -hmm. especially as it relates to this animal, but I don't care. Yeah. I, I, I know what I've seen. I know what I've experienced. I mean, the animal is real. And one way or another, uh, you know, uh, we're, going to, we're going to bring that definitive proof out so that the world can, uh, can know that this thing is real. Hey, can you speak a little bit to the NAWAC's um, – investigation do they still take and investigate sighting reports i mean i think you guys are so closely associated with area x that people yeah. might think that's all you do but man i'm you glad you brought that up because when brian was talking about the skepticism I'll, there's a there's a excellent recent report that just came in from north texas from this couple who was fishing and they saw these red eyes and they were certain this was a bigfoot and we had we turned uh turned it over to one of our investigators and uh you know, we told, you know, I, I just said, let's make, make sure you just be very skeptical. Be very skeptical when you when you talk to these people. And, you know, through his investigation, he, he determined that what they had most li most likely encountered was a barred owl up in the tree. With And owls do have bright red eyes when, when, when there's light that reflects off of them. And uh, he, his, his conclusion was that these people probably misidentified a, a barred owl and... Uh, you know, wanted to turn it into something uh, far more exotic, and more than likely was just a, a just a mundane species. And so, yeah, I mean, that just happened this last week. Yeah, so we we get them, and, and we and we do look into them, we do investigate them. But again, they're we're very skeptical. I would say one out of a dozen, maybe, in a in a good year, get through. The rest of them are misidentifications, hoaxes. Uh, you know, we don't feel confident about them. So, yeah, we take them. All right. Um, Brian, in Minnesota, do you guys get many sighting reports up there? I know you and I talked a little bit about this when you were on there before, but I'm just... Yeah, we don't, We don't. Uh, as an organization, we don't collect reports in Minnesota at this point. Um, so uh, I, I don't hear uh, of them because there's really no channel for me to, to be receiving them. I know that uh, there are a lot of active investigators in, in the northern tier of the state, especially... And, um, uh, and as, as it happens, uh, I was made aware of, 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 a, of, a, of an encounter, um, just recently, but it's, it's only because now we have, we have developed, uh, we have now four members in Minnesota. So we're sort of developing a little, um, you know, a, a splinter cell <laughs> of, of activity because we have, we have, we have bodies now. So, um, as it's, as it stands, we're not actively collecting uh, reports up here and, um, and that could just, change though. It could it could change, and now that now that we have sort of a, 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 a enough people, I think, to actually 
investigate and and do field work up here um i, I know next summer that's going to be something that we uh we really want to do we want to get out in in this state because I, I think there is um there is uh activity that is that is uh worth looking into in minnesota um so but as of as of right now we're not really investigating anything now well the habitat's okay. good the, re the region seem mm -hmm. which seemed to seem to support it i mean it's uh particularly northern minnesota uh, yeah. pop human population density is very low very there's lots low. of timber there's there's a yeah. there's a substantial amount of rainfall there's lots of water yeah um, so if you go into the, on, yeah, if you go into the, it's, it doesn't have quite the rainfall of, of area X, which is, which is phenomenal. But, you know, if you go into, uh, extreme Northern Minnesota and, um, uh, the, the, the boundary water canoe area, I mean, there's, there's hardly anybody in there, you know, and the people that do go in there, you know, they're, they're, there's no roads, so they have to follow the, the water and, and they're, so they're canoeing and, and, and kayaking and such. So it's tremendous habitat. The, the big, the big variable that I can't, and I can't put my head around and I have no way of knowing what they do is what they do in the winter because the winter up here is, is awful. It's, it's a really brutal winter. So do they, do they move out? Do they hunker down? What do they do? I have absolutely no idea. So it, it, that's just the big variable where I think that places further south uh, like area I mean, occasionally snows, but it's not like 30 below for eight weeks the way it is uh, in northern Minnesota. So I think that, if anything, would limit um, potential populations. That could be it. But again, I, I just don't know enough about the animal to be able to say one way or the other if that's true. Right. Okay. Um, Daryl talked a little bit about the uh, in the projects you had going on before mm -hmm. Area X, uh, especially the camera trap and or uh, game cameras and all those. Yeah, force visual. Um, yeah, those talk a little bit about those because we didn't talk about that at all when you were on last time, and it, there was so much work. I, I was reminded of this when I friended uh, Daryl on Google this past week because he's got some videos and camera trap stuff on there, and I was uh, reminded of those Bigfoot show episodes you did, or maybe it was the Bipto. It was the Bipcast. The Bipcast. Okay. Yeah. You yeah, know, I, mean, I only went on. I only went on one, and then I'll let Daryl talk. But the the I went in. I went on a uh, camera trap operation, part of Force Vigil, into uh, what what we used to call um, Area Y, which was in the big thicket of of uh, of, of East Texas, there, sort of north of uh, Houston, and it it was one of the most difficult things I'd ever done in my life. And we got to sleep at a in a beautiful facility every night. There's a there's a research facility there as part of the thicket. Um, as part of the, uh, the, the area there. And, um, so we got to sleep in bunks at night and we had showers and, and, uh, you know, an ice maker <laughs> and it was, it was like living large, but out in the bush, that is such incredibly thick, dense, um, stuff. And it was July 4th weekend and it was the hottest I'd ever been in my life. And I was working harder than I ever worked in my life. And, and you get, you, you, you start to realize, and this is something that a lot of people on, on, uh, in the world, uh, don't get is that, that there's such incredible wilderness, um, you know, a mile off the road in, in, yeah. this, in this country, especially there. So anyway, it, it was an incredible amount of work. And that wasn't even really an exceptionally difficult trip for you guys. Um, I, I mean, you weren't hip deep in water the entire time anyway. Yeah. Yeah. We, yeah. That, those, those trips um, were, were definitely uh, some, uh, some tough trips. There's no doubt about it. It was it was field biology, just down and dirty, yeah. raw field biology, where and it was mundane and boring work, very grueling. Where you go out, you put camera traps out, and in the most remote area you can you can uh, you can make it to on foot, and then you leave them there for months, and then you take a team in, you 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 hike back to the cameras again, and you you service the cameras, you you. You do a preliminary field check to see if you have anything that's any, any photos that are, you know, that are earth shattering. And yeah, so you mean, that means you're taking your laptop, you're taking your Epson field viewers, you're taking all this gear with you and, and then you're hiking out. And generally it would be a, a two to three day event for us to be able to hit all the cameras. And uh, it was, uh, it was extremely grueling work. And it was, uh, you know, a lot of, some people would say that, you know, it, it wasn't what they called, quote, Bigfooting or, you know, searching for Bigfoot mm -hmm. um, because, we, you know, we weren't, we weren't going out and, and call blasting and that sort of right. thing. We, we were trying to get photographs and, and video. And uh, we, were, we were taking a playbook, taking a page right out of the playbook of, of Field Biology 101. 
document a rare species, you put camera traps out. What, and, what, uh, what struck me about it, the whole approach, was that it was very disciplined. And, and as, as Daryl says, it really felt like uh, a more traditional approach to field biology as opposed to, um, you know, quote unquote, Bigfooting. Because uh, as he said, the, the whole point was to get in there, be as intrusive, at least at, at the least amount of impact as possible. Get in there, you know, get your camera serviced and, and get out. You're not really there to, to play around. You're not there to, to, you know, tell spooky stories. We didn't do anything at night. You know, we, we, we were back at the at the facility before sunset um, and we just recovered for the next day. So it, it wasn't what you would expect. Uh, you know, if you look at a show like Finding Bigfoot, it was absolutely nothing like that. Um, but, uh, you know, unfortunately, it, it didn't produce anything. But the, the group did it for five, six years. Right. I mean, it was, yeah. it was a long time. Oh, six to uh, 20, uh, 2006 to uh, 2011. So yeah, it's it how produced. Long. It produced uh, literally nothing. I mean, there was no, you know. No, it produced animal. knowledge. It produced okay. knowledge, but it did yeah. it did not produce any any sort of photographic or videographic no. evidence. Not not even one that might have been. You know, the in and, and I, I this is another question that I get a lot. You know, is there were no, um, you know, pictures that were even interesting. You know, it, it was it was pictures of nothing quite often. Uh, these cameras, especially in, in X, it seems like they would just start taking pictures because, you know, they're, 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 they're sensing heat and, and stuff like that in motion and the foliage gets hot and it blows in the wind and then it just takes, you know, and I'm not joking, 10,000 photos of a tree blowing in the wind and, and, and that's what you get. Um, or we've got probably a thousand bear photos at least. Uh, and we've got some other interesting photos of other animals, but again, not the target species, no, nothing that you would even say, Oh, look, there's a, you know, not like a fuzzy, you know, squirrel nose or anything like that. I mean, nothing even close. So it, it produced, uh, just a lot of experience. That's all. Yeah. You know, I would say that, uh, just, just because of, because of the, the, the vast numbers of photographs we got of, of bears, we actually became somewhat, we, yeah. we actually became, you know, use, use it kind of sparingly here, but we, we became very, very knowledgeable. I was going to say bear experts, but not not really bear experts, but very very knowledgeable of bears and various particular scenarios in photographs. Yeah, real insight I mean, we, into their behavior, right? We were able we were, we were able to identify bears just so quickly now in a photograph, and we learned their tactics. We learned what they what they did to. I mean, the bears literally would attack the cameras. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you'd see this this um, really blurry hair covered thing up close to the camera and we'd say it's a black bear because we knew it we just knew that how they did it and what they what they would do they would come up and actually try to eat the cameras and um you know something about the uh, petroleum in the plastic i guess attracts them they have these super sensitive noses and um it smells sweet to them so they would come up and try to eat the cameras and the first year, didn't you have a, you had a camera on another camera and you, you took a photo, you took photos with yeah. one of the cameras of the bear eating the other camera, destroying yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, I mean, you know, there have been some people involved in Bigfoot research who claim these, these wood apes are, you know, uh, sabotaging their cameras and that sort of thing. And I'm not going to say that's, that's not possible because we have had some things happen that, that lead us to believe that it is possible. But I would say everything I've seen it's bears, yeah. you know, I mean, just bears love to attack cameras. They just love to attack them. They love to chew on them, munch on them, tear them up. And, <laughs> um, so yeah, we, we sort of became bear experts, uh, experts on bear photographs in the wild. We see so, them do anything you can imagine from humping each other to rubbing, <laughs> rubbing against trees to attacking cameras to, you know, um, sniffing each other. Uh, I mean, just, Everything you I, can I was, imagine. You know? I was going to say we actually watched some bears grow up, but maybe we even actually watched them being conceived. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, know? exactly. We, yeah. we got everything but the uh, birth video, you know. <laughs> and uh, you know something we did, which in hindsight we probably shouldn't have done, Seth, was we we used to put out a lot of uh, scent attractants. Yeah, yeah. Which yeah. you know, bears have this incredible olfactory uh, sense, this capability, and and you know maybe we should have just if if we knew then what we know now, we probably would have gone through Operation Forest Vigil without any sort of, uh, uh, you know, scent uh, attractants. It's actually we one of the things that out quite a bit. I think that, um, you know, people in this field, uh, they, they like to ascribe all kinds of superhuman powers to, to, to Sasquatches. They can, they can see in the dark, which clearly I think they can, uh, but they have super hearing, they have super smell, they have super everything, right? And I, I, I think that smell is one of those things that I think that people in this field put too much 
too much stock in. I mean, we, we smell different when we get into the woods. And, and as Daryl has pointed out, if you spend time in the woods after a couple of days, you'll start to smell the smells that you don't smell in, you know, um, modern society. But fr from the standpoint of like, compared to a bear, I don't, I don't think that we have any evidence that they can smell anything as, as well as a bear. Um, mm -hmm. Bears have, have truly remarkable senses of smell. Um, so I, I think that, that, you know, all this like, the scent killing and everything else. I, I think that if you just try not to use uh, really smelly antiperspirants and soaps and things like that, um, you're you're in good shape. I don't think you need to go to the effort of of you know being in a plastic bag or anything to kill your scent. Mm -hmm. um, so is is this kind of what informed your change in tactics for like Area X? Because obviously you're not sticking up camera traps all over Area X, or are you? No. Mm -hmm. Okay. No. We, we right. actually, yeah. Go ahead. No, I was going to say we we've uh, we we're a nonprofit organization and we're driven primarily by the the, the donations and the the membership dues. So uh, we have limited resources, and what we had a lot of was cameras. And what we we came to the conclusion and again, this wasn't this wasn't something we just imagined. It was based on on experience in the field. We came to the conclusion that the cameras were were actively keeping the animals away and and so in in it would be nice to have some cameras for for tactical purposes not actually to get photos but to sort of um influence their behavior but we we had other things we wanted to try so we actually sold um i think every camera the the, the group had i don't know if we own any as a group anymore um, individual members have a camera, which I have one still, but I, I think we sold them all um, and plowed those resources back into other tactics. We're, we're trying to accomplish something, and, and at this point, I think, you know, if you go back to those BIPcasts 2008 or nine or whenever those were, seven maybe even now, um, you'll hear me and Daryl talking, and you'll hear Daryl say that we're hoping that a photograph will get someone interested. I don't even think back then anyone believed that it would be proof, but the, the point was to get someone interested in the subject, someone in government, someone in, you know, wildlife uh, capacity, um, you know, maybe uh, someone in a university. But I, I think at this point, we're of the opinion that even a photograph, even a really good photograph is, is simply not going to be enough to, to move the needle. It may get a couple of people interested, but will it get someone in a state uh, wildlife office or a, a, a large university um, nope. you know, moving resources. No, it won't. So, um, photographs and, and also I think that we're not really trying to prove to anyone outside the organization that we're having the experiences we're having. So getting a photograph or a video or something like that, um, we only want those things if they help further the mission that we have in front of us. Uh, we're not trying to do what a lot of people in this field are trying to do. We're not trying to get a photo that we can stick on the internet and have a lot of people debate over. Um, that's just not part of our mission at this point. So, um, no, we don't have any cameras. We're not putting cameras up anymore. Um, we just we, we just decided to, to reinvest those resources in other things. To use a baseball analogy, we are swinging for the fences. <laughs> yeah. We're not trying to get a single. We're not trying to get a double. We're three runs behind, and we're trying to clear the bases and, and put the game in our pocket. Yeah. And that's what we're trying to do. And uh, we, we have the power to do it. We definitely believe that. Yeah. And that's what we're working for. Uh, let's, let's get into Area X. And obviously when Brian was on, we talked a lot about Area X. So uh, some of our listeners who were around back then already are aware of it. But um, why, don't have you guys, yeah. why, don't we, why don't we have you guys tell us what Area X is and what goes on there as far as uh, the research, not necessarily – incidences but let's get into the research and what's what's going on there first well you sort of asked the question uh is that what led us to area x you know the camera trap project and it it wasn't it it, it was not the failings of the camera trap project that, that that led us to what we're doing in area x it was the knowledge we gained through the camera trap project and that knowledge was that we would go in there for three to four days at a time uh every every four to five to six months and we started to, a, a pattern started to develop. And we were very skeptical, but we began to consider things with an open mind. Usually toward the last day or night, when we were in Area X, uh, certain things would start to happen. Um, for instance, in 2007, the last night we were there, uh, we were all awakened at 5.30 in the morning by this tremendous, I mean, just, I had earplugs in. I sleep with earplugs because some of the guys snore. 
And so I had earplugs in and I heard it, it woke me up. It was so loud, it rocked the cabin. And the, the, the first thing I remember is Alton Higgins is, is standing over me, looking at me, and he's got his hands, he's doing his hands frantically. Something just hit the cabin, something just hit the cabin. And I'm, you know, I'm like, I know I heard it. You know, and, and everybody, the whole chaos, the whole cap, cabin is just chaos. And, you know, I get up and look out the window. I can't see anything because it's dark, but I can hear something moving off through the, through the trees. So we started to experience things like that. And so we started to, the wheel started turning and we started thinking and wondering well, what would happen if we stayed longer? Mm-hmm. If maybe, if maybe this, maybe these things are, uh, you know, the products of behavior of, of some sort of unknown mm-hmm. species, maybe, maybe they're getting impatient or, or maybe they're getting used to us. Maybe they're, they're, a little more bold. So let, what happens if we come in there and we stay two weeks or if we stay 30 days? Right. And so that sort of led to this whole premise now behind these last four summer, uh, summer long field studies. We go in now and, and now we're staying 120 days. Right. You know, uh, and Seth, and I think that, I think that's really important. I think that, that, um, the insight again, that, that, that would not have, we would not have known this had, had we not done forest vigil and, and done, you know, right. dozen, dozens of three day trips in there. Right. Uh, and then started to see this pattern. But this, 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 um, you know, I go back to, you know, what I said when we were in area wine, trying not to disturb and, you know, be as, as least impactful as possible, but we're not talking about bears and cougars here. We're talking about an animal that's really smart. We're talking about a primate. And I think, and I, I can't tell you why, and, and Daryl just touched on it, whether it's impatience or whether yeah. it's the curiosity finally right. gets to them and they can't help themselves anymore. But if you're there long enough where they are, right, they will engage. They, they will find, because yes. e- either, and again, we don't know, either they're trying to get you to go, um, and some of them may be trying to get you to go, or they may be wanting to quote unquote play with you. And some of them may want to play with you at the same time as some other one of them wants you to leave. Um, but if you're there long enough, uh, their, their big primate, their big monkey brains will, will, will sort of Can't help comp- it. will compel them. And, and that's what you, what you realize when, when you, when you're lucky enough as we have been to be where they are for long periods of time, very often it feels like they are being compelled to do things. They're not thinking about yeah. it. Th- these aren't logical decisions they're making. They're compelled to do things. And, and that's, uh, I think it's just cause they got big monkey brains, right? And, and, and they're not like other animals. Yeah. Yeah, because you think about it, you know, I, and I went through survive and evade training in the United States Air Force. If I wanted to escape and evade from somebody, right. if I did not want to be detected, right. man, I would button up, I would bush up, and I would I would stay completely, I would totally avoid all contact, any and all contact. These guys don't do that. No. For whatever reason, I don't know, but for whatever reason, after so many days and nights, they just can't seem to help themselves. Mm-hmm. Um you know, it, it's, we don't know the answer. There's a lot of things we don't know the answer to, but, um, no, that's one of them. Yeah. I mean, it, we, we tend to think Seth, that we're, we tend to think that we're smack dab in the middle of their business, that, that, that they've got something going on there. Uh, I don't know if it's a birthing area. It's a, it's a core area, something that is compelling them to uh, either be territorial, want, want to protect and drive us off. Um, or maybe it's just a, like Brian said, just a curiosity thing, or they just want to interact. Uh, they find or a combination. Yeah, it, it, they, it, it, yeah. Maybe, maybe we're, we're, we're maybe we're attractive to them somehow. I don't you know. You know what, what? What you're going to hear in the next episode of the Bigfoot Show, which isn't out yet, but we can talk about it here. And, and um, I'm, I'm happy to share this information. Is, is we had uh, we had more guests. You know, visitors in the group this year um, come come into the to the to the to the area, and one of the observations that was made was that that there is an incredible amount of uh, of protein everywhere in in where we yeah. are, and oh, and of yeah. course we're li- we're living in it, and we look at it every day, but it, but it never really like dawned on me until um, it was it was pointed out that that there's so many nuts falling from those trees. We have hickory nuts, and we have walnuts, and 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 uh, and all Pecans. kinds. Yeah. pecans and and all kinds of nuts and so um why are they there you know this is sort of the the big question and 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 the the thing that i will suggest on the next episode of the bigfoot show is why wouldn't they be there right of course they're there because there's so much food there aren't 
aren't really people except for us, you know. That's and, it. And and we're in a relatively small area. We do sort of the same things all the time, so we're kind of easy to keep track of. Um, but why wouldn't they be there? They have water 24-7, 365. They have food sources. They have cover. Local, you don't need to hunt nuts, right? You just have to pick them up off the ground and eat them. Um, so I, I think that it's a, it's a, it's a, there's this concept in, uh, in, in biology of, of a refugium, these areas where animals can sort of retreat and find everything they need to survive. And in, if you look at Area X, if you look at it topologically, if you look at it from, from a standpoint of what grows there, um, from rainfall and water supply, uh, th there's, 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 you, 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 you realize you know, again, why wouldn't that be exactly where they are? Of course, that's where they mm -hmm. are. And that's why they don't leave. Yeah. So, again, yeah. I'm, I don't know if we're answering your question, because I always talk about Area X with this assumption that everyone knows what I'm talking about. And I know that you're trying to sort of... Uh, introduce it. Right, introduce <laughs> it. So, we're, we're sort of like, we're talking about Episode 4 in the Star Wars trilogy at this point. <laughs> and, and we haven't even introduced who Anakin well, is yet. <laughs> yeah, we got to talk about Jar Jar first. Oh, Area, yeah, right. Area X, Area X was discovered discovered by Alton Higgins yeah. uh, back in two thousand. He was searching, he was searching for a place that might might uh, you know lead him to uh, to contact with the species. And in his search, he was he was uh, he was pushed toward this area, and it led to him finding a trackway, sixteen inch tracks, uh, to, in the year two thousand. And then he led an expedition there of uh, uh, some some biologists and they had definitely had some very interesting things not unlike what we're experiencing now and uh, and there was a sighting there of a of, of purportedly a small wood ape up in a tree very chimpanzee like which we've had our a number of sightings mm -hmm. very very similar to that mm -hmm. 2001 and then 2004 I, I went I had the, the um, pleasure of going in there and joining Alton in that area and right from the very first night actually Maybe the second night we had things that uh, happened. Uh, my wife was there, my stepson, and uh, yeah, stuff a we year now and a half, stuff we now know to be classic area X activity. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And a year and a half later, uh, we 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 put in we uh, deployed our first camera traps, uh, four or five camera traps um, in in that area, and then uh, you know I think we saw as many as a couple of dozen, 24, 25, maybe thirty cameras in there at one time. I mean, it's just. It, you know, and it kind of grew from there. And uh, we heard, you know, we heard the wood knocks and the, the rock throws and that sort of thing way back then. But uh, it was sporadic and we were very skeptical. I, I, I got to tell you, I, I was, man, it took me a long time to accept that, that, that these things were, were producing these wood knock sounds. You know, now yeah, it's yeah. just, I, I, it's, it's, there's no doubt whatsoever in my mind. Yeah, and, just, get, just given what we've experienced. And I don't know if we talked about it on the previous show, Seth, but you know the the how how Area X was discovered is is not there's no magic involved. It was good. It was good. Uh, you know, Field research, biology research yeah. and, and investigation. You know, yeah. he he, uh, he looked at a map. He's like, where would I go if I was one of these things? You know, so if he found a good spot, and uh, when he got in there. He, um, he, he talked to people and, and he talked to locals and the locals pointed him to, to, the, to where he should go. And so he, he got himself in the general area in the neighborhood and then uh, spoke to locals. And, and so it was investigation and, 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 uh, and just talking to folks. So yeah. th that's how we got there. Mm -hmm. um, it, it wasn't, uh, there was no incantations involved. <laughs> <laughs> no mind speak? No, nothing like that. All right. Um, Typical day in Area X, what does it consist of? Mm, Typical day? Yeah. Uh, that, that, that depends on, I mean, there, there are some variables in there. It depends because a typical day can be just uh, not, not much at all. Uh, a typical day can be extremely boring and uh, uh, where you're sitting out, uh, out in the bush somewhere and you're, you're, you're in a ghillie or you're very in a, in, a, in a hide or a blind and you're just sitting there hearing nothing and, and experiencing nothing. And, or it can, at the other extreme, it can be to where you are subjected to rock throws and wood knocks, uh, you know, every, every minute. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I've seen it, I've seen it that intense before. Uh, the la I would say the next to last day that Brian and I, the, the team was in there this year, NAWAC uh, Quebec team, that last day after about three o'clock, it got really intense. I mean, we had, I think we had as many as 
four visuals within the span of three, four hours, you know, and uh, yeah, it's crazy stuff, but uh, you know, um, it just depends. It depends. And, And we, we haven't learned what drives it yet. No. And we've you know? looked at lots of things. We've looked at, you know, uh, you know, lunar cycle. That's the first one a lot of people are like, well, what were the moon cycles like? We haven't really seen any correlation at all to moon cycle. Full moons, new moons, quarter moons, right. you know, waxing, right. waning makes no difference. Right. Um, the, the, you know, day or night, we have activity day and night. Um, we thought the creek rising yep. might, might uh, lead to less activity. Well, this last team, uh, yeah. half, half the time we were in there, that creek was just swollen and, and raging and... Yeah. Like I said, the last three days, yeah. particularly the last day, was just just tons of activity. I, I would say know? in the middle of the week, the creek was probably impassable uh, in, in a vehicle yeah, right. or, or for anything but the very largest animals. Um, yeah. So it, it's um, – but, you know, I would say like the, the, the perfect day, what you should do when you're down there, whereas what the typical day is like is, is you know, I would say that, that uh, it's important to um, get out in the bush – to, to even, even though I don't really expect when I go out in the bush that I'm going to see anything, that I'm going to have an experience or anything like that, I think it's important to get out there and, and sort of mix, mix up the, you know, the, the area and, 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 and become, and I I'm not going to say that I know exactly why this works and it doesn't always work, but when you go out there, perhaps um, they see you, they become more interested in you, and maybe they follow you back. You know? But what I've noticed is if you get out in the woods and, and actually beat the bushes a little bit, um, it's oftentimes you'll start to have some activity back. It seems, the to, stir, it seems yeah. to stir them up. Yeah. It stirs them up. So getting out there in the bushes is, is, is important. Uh, so Daryl, and one way you could do that is, as Daryl said, you know, you just go out there, you gilly up, you, you sit down and, and you hunker in for a couple hours and you, and you watch, you know, sort of still hunting. Um, sometimes that will, that will bring, uh, them in, but that's also a way like Daryl had a really interesting, uh, visual that last week doing exactly that. Um, and again, we, I'll set it up and then Daryl can tell you what he saw, but, but, you know, we, we try to, we try not to be random in what we do. And so that week we had, um, had some experiences in this very specific area that wasn't too far from the cabin in which we stay. So, uh, we had this idea that what we would do is we would sort of go over there as a group, um, you know, three or four of us and sort of make a big, you know, show of, of milling about and, you know, not being at all sneaky, and then, uh, you know, three or four of us would walk over, but then only two or three of us would walk back. And, and we would drop Daryl um, uh, sort of uh, in a space where he could, he could sort of hunker down and, and maybe not be, not be seen. So that was the plan. Um, we went over there and uh, we did exactly that. We sort of um, deposited Daryl and then we just made a big show of leaving. And uh, our hope was that they would come back into the area where we thought they were and Daryl would be able to see it. And that and that actually led to three visuals with, for me within the span of, of three hours. Yeah. You know, before Brian and uh, and D- Daniel left, we had a big rock thrown at us before they deposited me the first time. Um, so they left me. They left me there the first time. I only stayed there for a short time, and I got up and I started making my way back to the cabin. And on my way back to the cabin, there is another cabin, and I was confident that there was one down there where I had just come from. And so what I did is I put that cabin between me and it, and I used that cabin to uh, to block its view of me if it was indeed watching me. And, and it, it seemed to work because I, I stood, there's a tree in front of that cabin, and I stood there in front of that tree momentarily, a couple of minutes, just to kind of, uh, you know, if anything was expecting me to keep going down the trail, well, I just broke that expectation because now I'm, I've stopped moving. I'm standing in front of the tree. If it was watching me, it's lost sight of me. And so now it's got to be wondering, if it was a person even, it's got to be a person or an animal. It's got, it's got to be wondering where I've gone because now I, I didn't continue down the trail. And so, so I just kind of eased out from behind that tree and peeked around the cabin. And there on the, on, to my left, back at the uh, uh, southeast corner of this fenced area behind this cabin, I see this head uh, poking up above the vegetation, uh, above the ridge. And it's a huge, like a honey or a blonde colored head and it just and i slowly raised my rifle toward it and the head just slowly moves down and it, it's gone it was peeking through sight. some it was peeking through some branches and some roots yeah. it was it was sort of laying down behind a a, a little uh, dry creek area 
and so there was a rise there and it was and i went back there and i put my head exactly where it was and it was just sort of peeking through these these uh these branches at daryl and brian uh, brian was dwarfed by this thing. i mean his, his head was this thing was much bigger than he was it was amazing so so with that success i, I went to the cab and told brian and the guys and uh, what had happened so brian said well let's do it again so they took me back out there and this time i put on a rain suit and uh, really camoed rain suit and uh, you know got really camoed and we found a really good spot right behind that cabin that I used to hide behind. There was a log to my right. On the left was this huge berm. So if any, it was going to be difficult for anything away from me to see me because it was concealed by the log on my right. To, to my left I had this big berm with lots of vegetation and this is in a very densely wooded area. So for anything to see See me, it was going to be difficult to visibility all around. So, you know, I sat there for about three and a half, four hours, something like that. And I heard a lot of vegetation, a lot of movement through the vegetation just on the other side of that berm. So I suspected that there was at least one around. Um, but it was starting to get dark. It was going to get dark soon, and I started debating what, what I was going to do. Was I going to stay out after dark, or was I just going to go ahead and go back to the cabin? This was... The next, this was the next to the last night we were going to be there. And so uh, I, I have a red dot scope on my rifle. I just, it was start, it was starting to get, you know, toward dusk. And I just sort of dialed down my red dot. And I was just looking at that. And I just happened to glance over to my right above the log that's here beside me. And I see this big brown figure just step out into the open. And it's about 50 or, or 60 yards from me. And it's just a big brown mass. Um, in, you know, envision, if you would, a door frame um, with the, 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 the top corners sort of softer, uh, more rounded. And, and this is all happening very fast. Um, I see it. I swing my rifle above the log. I have, to, I have to get my rifle above the log to have any sort of shot at it. So in the process, my rifle comes up, and I'm sure it saw that movement. And it takes off. It's gone, just like that. So, you know, I'm, I'm cursing, you know, um, I just missed my chance. Had it stayed there for two more seconds, I would have been able to put my dot on it and send it around. Well, no sooner have I had time to, to, to curse about that than a second figure runs across the opening. It appears taller than the first, but thinner, and it's a blur. It's just a huge brown blur that just, 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 I mean, it just zooms across that opening. The opening, we went there, uh, Travis Lawrence and I went there the next day, and I guess it was about a 10-foot opening in the vegetation. And it's gone. And then I can hear them uh, moving through the woods, flanking me. And uh, that unnerved me. So I got up, and I was going to try to beat them back to the trail. I didn't want them to get behind me. And I got to the trail. I looked down the trail to see if I could see them coming across, and I think they probably already beat me across. And then I heard a wood knock back from where I had just been deployed the whole time. So my sense was right. To prob I'm, I'm very confident there was one back there on the other side of the berm because that's where the wood knot came from. And then I had these two step out, uh, you know, to my, as I'm facing, I guess, to my 2 o'clock, and that's when I saw them over there. To a certain and, extent, that's just a classic, classic Area X kind of encounter where the, the foliage is so thick in there. Um, when you see something, it hap it's, it starts and it ends all within just a couple of seconds. Uh, in and um, th there's just it's just classic, you know. And and, and uh, you know, so again, well, why don't you shoot it? Well, I mean, he oh, I was, definitely, I was absolutely going to. <laughs> he would, no he, doubt about it. He didn't have time, <laughs> right? Um, it's 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 uh, again, the, these aren't they aren't deer. They don't just like walk out and, and look stupidly at you while you, while you turn your rifle around. They, the, the, they're, they're programmed to, to want to be uh, furtive and, and to, and to, uh, to run if, if they think we see them. So in any event, I, I, you know, I think Daryl, my interpretation of, of Daryl's experience is that I, I don't think it would have stepped through that opening in the foliage uh, and given itself away to Daryl had it known Daryl was there. So I, I think in, yeah. in retrospect, um, whether or not there was another animal nearby who may have known he was there, the two that he saw, um, I don't think they did until he moved. And I think you're right. Yeah, yeah I think yeah. you're right. I mean, it just stepped right out there. Right. And I, I mean, I got to tell you, I, I mean, I was going for a headshot, and I have no qualms whatsoever 
I would have put that red dot on the head and I would have sent it and it had it just given me two more seconds, but you know, wasn't, wasn't meant to be at that time. Nope. Not that. Time. So, um, with a lot of groups, organizations, I think this one event would be like the highlight of, uh, <laughs> of, yeah. of a lifetime of research. But for yeah. you guys, this seems like a, a pretty typical summer event. I mean, this kind of stuff is, is constantly happening. There's been other incidences that remind me of this one, but, yeah. um, this yeah. summer there there seems like there was a lot of activity and before I even get into any more of it I would I do want to mention Brian's show the Bigfoot show will have an episode inevitably coming out that will cover all of this stuff and probably much more in depth cuz uh, Brian has easier access to everyone than I do obviously so uh make sure yeah. to stay tuned to uh the BFS for that episode and I'll link to it when we get it out but Brian um there was an incident with you that involved you, mm -hmm. uh, a sighting, and then there was I want I don't know if you're allowed to, but I I want you to talk a little bit too about the um, almost the quadrupedal kind of uh, gate that someone saw on the ones running up the creek bed. Do you know what I'm talking? Yeah, about? Yeah, 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 yeah. So it. I'll tell you I'll tell I'll tell you my thing, which is. Um uh actually not that interesting <laughs> but uh what what was interesting about it is again, you're talking it, about it, the one this year yeah it gives you in, it gives you in, yeah it yeah, gives you insight cool. into it gives you insight into behavior the actual visual wasn't wasn't that wasn't that impressive but so you know we're sitting around the campfire and daniel falconer was on there uh people in the in the in the you know uh field of sasquatch enthusiasm know who daniel falconer is probably he's he's uh he w and he he was in there uh, at at our invitation the last the last week that we were down there and so we're sitting around the campfire one evening it was uh, you know almost dusk it was probably about six or so and we were looking at pictures on his uh, camp on his computer because uh, he was just at Comic Con and so he was showing us pictures of cosplayers and things like that and and we were just having a nice time and um, maybe. Uh, Eighty yards uh, to our west, uh, we hear what we've been hearing all summer long: the sound of of a heavy, you know, thick piece of of tree. We saw uh, the top of it. Yeah, coming down, and then I looked, and I could see it. Yeah, you know, through the other trees, it, it wasn't as 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 easily seen as the one that I saw on the second week of the operation this year. But I could see the tree coming down. Yeah. And it looked like it was the top third of a tree coming off of, off of it. Uh, and again, we're sitting there. There's no wind. There's no reason for this tree to have come down. There is zero, right. zero wind. It, Go ahead. And this was this was typical activity this summer too. This right? summer, the yeah. The, talk, the, the can tree you talk thing. a little bit about that too? Yeah, sure. I mean, uh, how many did we document, Daryl? Dozens. Literally uh, dozens. Yeah, I mean, it's just uh, it's uh, it's phenomenal, uh, and it's it's something that's. That we've seen in the past, Seth, but I think it I think it went to a new level this year. It seemed that they employed this, and yes, I do believe that it was apes that did the the, the vast majority of these tree these tree falls. Uh, it seems like this was a new tactic that they, maybe not new tactic, but it's something that they used at a greater level than before. Yeah, I mean we have you know? this is our fourth operation, so we don't have a a ginormous data set to work from, but and and we have experienced. Um, trees breaking in the past nothing to the nothing that we could easily say or conclusively say was ape behavior but this year they've just it's like a, to an order of magnitude greater uh degree of, of frequency even even to the very last week that we were there when this night when when this tree came down well and and this tree fall alone the one that you're talking about now you could take that out of context and you say okay it's a tree a tree fell it's a big right. deal but when you continue to tell what happens after that Right. Then this, it, this is and this is why it's an interesting experience. Yeah. So Daryl, um, being my very good friend, Daryl, he he's like I'm gonna. He, so he picks up his rifle and he goes. He 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 gets up and he goes and he's gonna go investigate this tree fall. Uh, he's gonna investigate. It. <laughs> so we uh, we get up and uh, Daniel's with me and Daryl busts into the into the into the woods and uh, Daniel and I go along the road. We're sort of paralleling each other, but Daryl is, is uh, maybe 50 yards, 40 yards away from us in the thick of it, and we're out on the road. And uh, we're, we're going towards where this tree was. Now, we never actually found this tree, uh, but uh, again, when the sun came up the next day, we didn't go look for it because it was just another tree that came down. But at that point, we couldn't really identify which tree it was. So Daryl's in there, and, and Daryl, you heard something moving up the mountain away from you. Oh, yeah, yeah, I could hear clear movement up the mountain, uh, definitely uh, uh a large animal that 
and, and you know, the way I interpreted it was there was a large animal that was fleeing the scene. Right. It was, it was trying desperately to put space between me and it. And I couldn't see it, but I could hear it. So and Daniel and I are back on the road, and uh, we're talking to each other, and, and we heard a wood knock behind us, which would have been on the opposite side of the road from where this tree came down. Really, in exactly the same area where Daryl was positioned when he had his visual, but I think this happened, this was before you had your yeah. visual. But yeah. it was in the exact same spot. There was a, a really clearly evident game trail back there um, that had been seeing a lot of traffic, and we had perceived a lot of activity back there. So this was, I think, the night before um, Daryl had his visuals. And so we heard a wood knock from this area, and I, and I turned around and looked, um, and I thought I saw something moving, but I was walking on the road when I saw it move. So I stopped. And I sort of hunkered down and I looked, I sort of peered intently through the, the trees at this spot. And I saw there was a, there was a, a tree that was probably a foot and a half or so you know, wide, maybe two feet wide. It was sort of a larger tree. And I saw what appeared to me to be a, an all black, um, it was dark, so I don't know what exactly color it was, but it was all black. And it was the, the upper torso of, of a bipedal figure uh, ducking behind a tree. It was a tree peeker. And so I saw it bending at its waist, looking out at me. And when I looked at it, and I said, like, oh, shit. <laughs> yeah, you yelled. You, yeah. you all yelled. Yeah. yeah. Well, as soon as I saw it, when I just saw the motion, I didn't know what it was. But I think yeah. what it was doing is I think it was getting behind the tree. Yeah, and then when, yeah. I, when I looked at it, I, saw it, I think it saw me looking at it, and it, yeah. and it ducked behind the tree. And it yeah. was clear what it was. I mean, there was there was right. no doubt in my mind. I knew exactly what I was seeing when I saw it. It was yeah. the upper half yeah. of a torso of, a, uh -huh. of an upright figure peeking around a tree and then going back behind the tree. So yeah. at that point, we yell for Daryl. And um, and, and Daryl... Da Daniel said, Daryl, we have an animal! We have an animal! <laughs> yeah. We have an uh, animal! <laughs> uh, so so Daryl comes over and, uh, and, and, and we go in there after it. Um, and then, you know, it's Daryl's story again at that point. Oh, I just, I just pursued it down the trail, and uh, Brian's, I guess, what were you, 30 yards behind me, Brian? 20 yeah, yards? I, I stopped it where I think it was, but you kept going in there, yeah. And, and you know, I, I, we're well aware that you can't physically chase these things down. Right. But when we pursue like that, it's not, it's not thinking we're going to catch this guy. It's to get them to, to make a mistake. It's to get one of the others in the troop to reveal itself, to to maybe throw a rock from another location, and then we have a, a better opportunity, or it's to force things to happen. Which is that's what the I, only... I think that's what this was, you know, and, and I think we've talked on the show, Seth, and I know I've talked about it on the Bigfoot show, this, this uh, distractionary tactic that they do. I mean, mm -hmm. distractionary is not even a word, but, you know, they, they will try to draw your attention. If, they, if, if in this case, uh, a tree came down, Daryl heard something going up the, up the mountain. Whether or not that was an ape means nothing, because I, what I believe now to be true is this other ape thought that we had, we were getting too close to one of its kind, right? Yeah. One of, one of its troops. So it did a wood knock. And what's to distract. Really, to distract. And it worked, but this time we, we saw him. And what, what's really interesting, Seth, about that time of year, this was, this was in September. This was after Labor Day, so mid-September. Um, what's really interesting this particular year is that the foliage was, was down about, I would say maybe 20%. Mm -hmm. And it was enough that we could see into the forest much better than we could say in August or July, where yeah. it's, it's like Vietnam in there. So what my, my theory is that we had so much activity the last week, you know, Daryl's sighting of the one in the, in the, in the, in, you know, that he saw from behind the tree that was up in the, that sort of lowered its head down. Um, this visual, conceivably even the, the other visual he had of the two figures, I don't think that the animals understood to what extent they were visible back inside the foliage. I think that the, there was enough of it had come down that they didn't realize that they were as visible as they were. So that, again, that's just a, a hypothesis. I have, no, I have no way to prove that. But um, yeah, so that's what happened. So again, what Daryl pointed out, that this tree came down, but then, you know, concurrent with the tree there was a, a, a visual sighting of what only could have been a wood ape um it, so I, I think that it's when you start to draw these connections between the the tree break behavior and then other types of behavior or visuals it becomes really hard to sort of explain away all of them as is uh, just natural trees falling down
Mm -hmm. Brian, I pursued that one probably 200, 250 yards in the bush. Seth, we could hear it, could still hear the movement. I mean, it, it was definitely fleeing. And I could hear rock displacement and continued movement and just continued to pursue, hoping to get some sort of opportunity that something would arise from that. Finally broke off the chase at about 200, 250 yards in now there. At that and, point, it was, it was starting to get dark, you know. It was, yeah, it was probably yeah. almost 7 yeah. o'clock or so at that point. And that time of year, it, it's, uh, in, it's the sun is behind the mountains and it's starting to get dark in there. Yeah, and when you push too far like that, you're, if, you're, if you're out by yourself, it, you're sort of, you know, I mean. I, it's a bad I, idea. Yeah, it's not really a good idea because uh, yeah. you always want to have some sort of backup. You know? And Brian was Let's, back there, but I didn't really know. Oh, no, I didn't, I was, at that time, I didn't know where he was. No, and, and I, I wasn't, I wasn't, um, I wasn't, I wasn't, I wasn't close enough to you to be of any help. There's got to be kind of an intimidation factor in there too. I mean, especially when you're talking about night. What do you? How do you guys feel about these things in terms of? Because right now, <laughs> uh, there seems to be a very strong. Uh, giant monster vibe going on with Bigfoot, yeah, yeah. especially in the community. I mean, what we don't have that vibe that a little bit. Yeah. We okay. don't have that. We don't share that vibe. It, it, to us, it's, a, it's an undiscovered great ape, uh, you know, that is large, no doubt, that is powerful, that could probably kill us. And here, but I, I, here, here's the thing, Seth. So, so uh, something else that Daryl and I did that last week, one of the, you know, maybe one of the coolest things I've ever done down there. Uh, I'll set it up and I'm sure Daryl will, will correct me along the way as I say things <laughs> slightly wrong. But, you know, we, we, we wanted to experiment. We wanted to find out if we could get into the valley uh, without, being, without being seen, without being discovered. So it was, uh, if you remember back in September, we had a quote unquote super moon, full, full moon event. And so Daryl and I uh, were driven out of the valley, um, away from, from Area X. And uh, we, the, the plan was that we were going to be dropped off um, about three to five miles away, and we were going to hike in. Um, and we were going to do this basically in the middle of the night. It was, it was like 11 o'clock, Daryl, or something when we got dropped off? We started out a little off uh, about 10, 15, yeah. 10, 20 is when we started our hike. So uh, it, was, it was literally the, the middle of the night, and we were going to come in with zero lights. We were going to come along the road with no lights. And the only way that I think that it made it possible for us to do this uh, was the fact that the full moon was, was, was very bright. Um, so, so this was what we did and I'll tell you, and, and I'll tell you what we did, but, but the point I'm trying to get at is, you know, I think that the fear and the giant monster thing comes from a, a lack of understanding and knowledge and, and we've been down there now so much and, and even like I'm speaking for myself now, I've been down there, uh, enough that I, I, I understand they're wild animals and I understand wild animals need to be respected at all times because they're unpredictable and they do strange things and a deer can kill you, right? I understand that. But they're just animals. They're not monsters. They're not malevolent. They're not evil. You know, I've heard people talk on podcasts about how they sound like demons and stuff like this. And, mm -hmm. and you, you can't, if you really want to be investigating them if you want to try to get to the bottom of what this animal is and you want to do what i would consider science you have to try to let go of that stuff you have to move past it appreciate respect them as wild animals but the entire time i was out on that road with daryl and i'm convinced we had an encounter on that road uh at no point did i feel fear and that isn't because i'm stupid it's because i know what this animal does and i was also fairly well armed and I was with Daryl who was also similarly well armed so I, I I think that we were prepared and we had we had knowledge and understanding so even though I was doing something that five years ago me would would not even understand that uh, how I could do it I, I never once felt fear on that road and and I think it again it's it's you have to you have to have an understanding of that this is just an animal and, and that it's not trying to hurt you. It doesn't probably want to even have any interaction with you. And, and I think that too many people in, in, in this, who are interested in this field are interested in, for the scary stories. You know, they, they want to they wanna freak themselves out. Yeah. I think that's good. I think that's perfect. Um, you know, I mean, there aren't, there, I, was, I will say that there are times when I feel fear in there. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, 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 but you, 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 learned, you learned to channel your fear. Right. And, into energy and in, into fuel and uh, I mean that's just that's the way you overcome fear you know you just let it channel you you know you let it you let it fuel you into what you need to do 
And, uh, the, the, when I feel when I am the most afraid down there, it's usually because something unexpected just happened. Not you know not because yeah yeah. It's, it's Start, a, you're startled. You're startled, yeah. right? So yeah, I, yeah. I, it, it's it's that kind of fear. It's the kind of fear where like you're on edge and you're heightened. Your your senses are heightened because something unexpected just just took place, and you want to make sure that you're not going to get yourself hurt. But but am I afraid? I'm not afraid of Bigfoot. I'm not afraid of wood apes because I I think that that uh, I ju I just know how they act. You know, yeah. and, I, and I don't I don't think they're trying to hurt anybody. Yeah, I mean, you could bring somebody down there that's not experienced who would, uh, you know, and we and we and that happened this summer. Uh, people come down there that aren't experienced, and they experience what we what now is is really mundane behavior for us. You know, throwing softball sized rocks, you know, crashing yeah. on the roof of the cabin, and it yeah. bounces off the cabin and bounces onto the ground. That terrifies a new person that comes in there. It terrifies, and for them. good reason. I mean, this yeah. is this is like you know, this is advanced. Bigfooting, right? I mean, this is like not a 101 level class. This is a 301 class, a 401 class. You are, you know, you don't go to Area X um, because you watch Finding Bigfoot on TV. You go to Area X for for different reasons, and and it it's it can be intense. And and when when Daryl's not exaggerating. I photographs of these rocks that came in, the rocks sitting on top of tin, rocks that that are the size of you know uh, softballs and larger. Um, that will freak you the hell out, man. If, if you're just sitting around the campfire and all of a sudden there's this giant rock come sailing in, not a little one, a big one. And then, you know, you start thinking like, what the hell can throw a rock like that that far? You know, what was the intent of the person, the creature? Whatever. And it's dark. It's dark. So oh, yeah, you've already ruled that people. Right. It's there. It's coming from a mountain ledge that's right. rocky and steep. It's hard right. to even traverse during the daytime. Right. And so, yeah, so all these things come into play and it just... It can it can definitely put some weight on your psyche, but with the, if you're not, ex it's experience though, isn't it? It's experience. Yeah, yeah. The, the longer you're there, yeah. you're like, oh, they're throwing they're throwing the big rocks, and that doesn't oh, mean good. There they are. They're sure <laughs> right. good. They're, they're, good. they're showing themselves. Right. Yeah. Awesome. Excellent. Awesome. <laughs> yeah. I'm excited. Let, let, let's go. Fist um, pumps. Yeah. <laughs> do, do do it again. You know. Um, but but other people, uh, it could freak them out, and, and and that's perfectly natural. I, I again, it's it's all experience though. You know, it's all about having, and you know, to your point earlier, Seth, about how. You know, uh, Daryl's sighting sounds like just another day in the woods of Area X. I, I don't want to give that impression because we don't see him like every single day. It's not like that at all. It, it's still, it's still a pretty big deal when when we have a visual if for the group. We we you know it's it's an event for us when when we have a visual. Um, but uh, if you, if you're down there, I was down there for three weeks this year, and I don't think I was even in the top five of people who put in the longest amount of time. I mean, we we've had guys down there. Alton Higgins, I think, was the leader this year in, in time spent down there, wasn't he, Daryl? Travis, then Alton. Travis yes, you Alton. were in the top five. Oh, great. I made <laughs> yeah. the top five. Yeah, yeah, you were. <laughs> but if, you, if you're down there for weeks at a time uh, over the years, again, you, you just sort of, you, you, and I don't want to say you become an expert, but you start to appreciate and, and have insight into their behavior and you realize that if they wanted to, if they were seriously dangerous and scary animals, you know, you, you wouldn't, something would have happened a long time ago. Now that's not to say that they have uh, that there aren't aren't times that we believe that they've they've pushed the envelope at, sure. at scaring us. I mean, there, there have been some bluff charges in there that uh, that, that literally scared the crap out of our people. You know, and, I mean, there's no exaggeration whatsoever. Yeah. Um, so, but those are few and far between. And to put right. it in perspective, our uh, our field study this year was 122 days in length. We had, if I'm remembering correctly, from our the the data that we uh, demonstrated at the retreat, I think we had something along the lines of 16, 17, 18 hard contacts, hard visuals uh, out of 122 days in there. Now, there were uh, probably a couple dozen of possible visuals. That is, uh, these were much more fleeting. Uh, you know, maybe you saw a, a hairy something uh, at six feet up through a small gap in the vegetation. We call that a possible sighting. But hard contacts, hard visuals where you can – you definitely can say that's what this person saw. I think it was along the lines of 16 or 17 out of 122 days in there. Oh, so, so, yeah, so it doesn't happen every day, and, and it doesn't happen yeah. for every member. And and uh, I, I know that sometimes you listen to our accounts of what happens in there, and it's probably easy to get the impression that, you know, we're seeing Bigfoot every single day. Well, those are the highlights. Time. Right, but we're only we, talking we, – we, Yeah. We don't, we don't talk about the, you know, eight days in a row where nothing yeah. happened at all. Where Delta team, <laughs> you, know? you know, Delta team goes in there for five days, and all they do is sit around and watch the rain come down. Right. Yeah, that's pretty they, don't, they, they hear virtually nothing. They see virtually nothing, you know, until Alton gets there and, and has a possible siding up on the mountain. But 
for five days, absolutely nothing occurred. Maybe one or two wood knocks. But, you know, the other we don't thing, talk about that stuff. Seth, do you want me to talk about the, uh, the, the, the quadrupedal? Yes, you know? absolutely. Yeah, I find that fascinating. Yeah, I'll, and I'll say right now, and this is, this is sort of the, the, the centerpiece of the Bigfoot show I'm working on, and, and I think what, what we're going to talk about here is, is probably the most important visual sighting that anyone's ever had in Area X. So oh, yeah. This, this is Travis Lawrence yeah. and, and Gene Bass. And, and what team were they on, Daryl? That was Mike team. Mike team. So they're, they're, uh, so, you know, it's well into the operation at this point. Yeah. Uh-huh. And, and, and they keep hearing, uh, wood knocks from an area that is not too far from, from where we are, but is in, a, in an area because it's really not on the way to any place that, that we don't really go into that often. So they go to investigate this and, and the, the, you know, Travis is, as he relates on the Bigfoot show and in the interview that I have with him, he um he's not going over there to to see an ape he's going over there to find what tree they're beaten on because he's imagining that there there must be some visual or you know physical evidence of this tree getting getting uh, abused so they go over there um to do that and you know sh- the the brief version of this is they enter the area uh travis hears uh, sort of a a low sort of huff sound uh, just a, a, yeah yeah that um, and, and, and then he hears what sounds like, uh, squirrels coming out of a tree and, but big squirrels, he turns and looks, and again, I'm, I'm condensing this down for the sake of brevity, and he sees four, um, animals in a row, uh, small animals, um, bigger than raccoon, but, but not like a grown up wood ape at all. Uh, these, these are juvenile wood apes. They look exactly like chimps. There's four of them in a row. Their heads are down. They have very wide shoulders, and they're they're running in a row uh, up the creek um, silently. He can't hear them. He can see them at this point because you know they some one of them made a noise coming out of the tree, which is what clued him in that they were there. He turns and he sees them. Gene saw one of them, the sort of the tail animal, um, but he sees four of these things running running up the creek uh, on all fours. Uh, from behind, clearly, you know, very again, wide shoulders going down to a narrow waist, um, running on all fours. And uh, so, uh, our, our our hypothesis is that the huff sound was the the, t- the tender, you know, the minder, um, uh, sort of alerting the other animals that, that 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 Travis and Gene were in the area, and that it was time to leave. And so they came out of the tree. What were they doing in the tree? They could have been eating nuts. Um, I don't know what they were doing in the tree, but the, there were four of them up in a tree. Now, again, this is, uh, I, I've seen a, a small black animal jumping from tree to tree last year. Kathy Strain saw it twice. Uh, we have uh, numerous other members. Plus, uh, as Daryl said, one of the very first reports that brought us into the area that got us interested was, that, was a, a report of an animal, a small animal, like a chimp, jumping from one tree to the next. So what, what, why I think this is such an important sighting is you have four small juvenile animals all of about the same age. Now, if, what I know about primates is primates, big primates, like humans and gorillas and, 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 and orangutans, generally have single births. You know, you're not having multiple births when, when you give birth. You're having single animals. Um, there's four of them that all appear to be about the same age. So now you can start extrapolating. And and I've tried to look into this. There really isn't a a number, uh, some sort of formula. But if you have four juveniles, that means you probably have four mothers. And if you have four mothers, then you've got at least one father, maybe more, depending on what their social structure is like. And there's all kinds of conversation we can have there. Uh, But now what you're talking about is if you see four God, there could be 20. I mean, there could be a lot. So what this tells me, why I think this is so important is it, you know, and then there's the, the other piece of this. Um, Daryl saw two animals. I've had experiences where I've seen two animals in there. We actually have quite a number of, of visuals where you're seeing two animals at a time. Was it eight to 10 over the last four years? Correct. Brian, you asked me that so, question. I, so I don't know if that's uh, mated pairs. I don't know if that's, uh, you know, mothers and their children. I don't know what those two animals are, but we see lots of multiple, relatively speaking, lots of multiple animal uh, encounters. And now we have four that all appear to be uh, very young and all appear to be about the same age and probably aren't quadruplets, right? Um, so I, I think I think that, you know, going back to this concept of ref- refugium, Area X, so, as, as far as I can tell, as far as any of us can tell, uh, it c- appears to be um, a, a refugium 
for a, a population of uh, relic hominids, you know, large um, primates that live in North America, and and it's where they 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 birth. It's where they go because there's plenty of food, and and they apparently uh, they create new wood apes <laughs> when they're down there. I, I I I I just I don't I can't come to any other conclusion. I don't believe that these were chimps that Travis saw, even though to his mind that's what they looked like. You know, they looked like chimps. I don't. I don't believe that's what they were. Um, so yeah. It, and also, I, I asked Travis about the possible misidentification of black bears because, right. you know, we have photographed, uh, you know, double bear cubs, three bear cubs. We photographed that. Sure. And bears are a lot of times they have, uh, you know, siblings like that. But you know, Travis and and Gene both said that just absolutely did not appear to be bears. Let me read this. This is directly from the after action reporter, the field notes. Um, this was at 3.15 in the afternoon, um, and it was on August 11th, 2014. I just want to read this. It won't take me just a second here. While Lawrence and Bass were hiking in an area about 75 yards south of the east cabin, specifically looking for wood knocking sign, Lawrence thought he heard a very subtle huff, <clears throat> like that, a short distance to his east, which caused him to pause and stare at the woods to his east for about 10 seconds. Seconds later, he heard what sounded like an animal sliding down a tree to the ground. Lawrence then snapped back around to the east and observed a, quote, small, dark-colored animal, close quote, moving through the underbrush. When he first saw the animal, Lawrence thought it was a raccoon. He then called out to Bass, saying, look at that. As this was happening, Lawrence noticed that there was more than one animal moving through the brush and caught one of them visually as it moved through a patch of sunlight. In the sunlight, Lawrence could see the color was a very dark red, Lawrence initially and for a very brief period thought the animals were small hogs, which he later admitted in hindsight did not make much sense. However, upon seeing an animal this color, uh, the only species of animal with which his brain could identify was wild hog at the time. At this time, Bass also observed one of the animals as it moved through a small opening in the brush. He described it as a brownish red, but was not able to see the animal with much detail as it was heavily obscured by the brush. Lawrence could tell the animals were moving east up a mostly dry creek bed, so he took a step to his right to see up the open lane. He was surprised to observe small, four small hair-covered animals that looked just like small chimps, moving quadrupedally in the manner of chimps, briskly, and in a straight line perhaps two feet apart, one right after the other. The animals moved rapidly up the creek and were gone within a second of Lawrence realizing what they were. He estimated their weight at no more than 30 to 40 pounds, their quadrupedal height at no more than two feet, he noted that the animals' upper bodies were longer and wider than their lower bodies, and they ran with their heads down. Lawrence emphatically compared the four animal sizes and movements with chimpanzees. Bass saw the last animal in the line briefly. Uh, they described the animal's color as reddish-black and resembling the color Lawrence had recently seen in a fisher in Vermont. Bass described the one animal he saw as dark reddish-brown. The visual encounter lasted perhaps five seconds for Lawrence. Um, that's, I mean, that's, that, that's it. I mean, I, so yeah, so I, I the reason why I think this is the most important visual that we've ever had in Area X is because I think it gives us an, uh, it, it's a brief but I think a really telling insight into what they do there and why they're there and and uh, what 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 we're dealing with and and why don't they leave because there's no reason for them to leave they should be there that's exactly where they should be um, what are they doing there they're procreating you know um, the, it it is it is. I think uh, a North American wood ape refugium, and I, and I yeah. don't and I don't believe I don't believe it's the only one that exists. You know, I think there there must be more, um, but uh, it, we're we're just through through you know really intelligent field work through investigation and through uh, a lot of persistence, we're there, and mm -hmm. uh, so we get to have these experiences, and and uh, and uh, I'm just I'm I'm. I continue to be amazed by what by what Travis and Gene saw that day. Yeah. All right. We're going to get into the uh, wrap-up here. But before we do that, I have to ask you one final question, and it's going to come from a uh, devil's advocate point of view. But before I ask that question, um, so what I've seen a lot lately, especially in uh, Bigfoot groups, community groups, Facebook, all this, um, is people referring to – to posting a uh, some form of evidence, whether it would be a photo of a purported Bigfoot or a mm -hmm. footprint track, and everyone calls it 
peer review. All right. And then <laughs> and then all these people on Facebook, they all weigh in right. typically to tell the person that posted it that they're crazy, which a lot of time I agree with. But yeah. there there needs to be someone needs to understand the definition of peer review, which is that the the peer needs to be somehow relevant to that field of study. And most of people on Facebook looking at photos <laughs> and footprint tracks have no knowledge of that field of study. So right. Right. before we really get into this, and the reason I'm saying that is I know there have been some incidences over the last year where people were generally down on the area X, not, it's not like a huge, you know what I'm talking about. I know Most exactly what you're talking about. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Uh, we've had people say they want to spit in our faces, man. So whatever, you know, Yeah. <laughs> I mean, really, I don't really care what people say to be quite honest. Right. So in my, in my opinion, no, uh, researcher owes you anything. And I'm saying this to the general person who's interested in the subject. If someone mm -hmm. is willing to put something out there for people to, to check out, I think that's awesome. I, I'm, I'm all for it, but no one owes you their evidence. Having said that, where's the proof of what's going on in Area X? Where do we I, have I, proof? I would say every, not everyone, but but a lot of the people who go in there, the entire reason we expend so much evidence, so much evidence, so much uh, energy and effort as a group is to produce that evidence. I'm sorry, not evidence, the, the proof. We're not, evidence has gotten us nowhere in 50 years of collecting it. We have really good footprint. And I say we, I mean we as, 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 a, as a, you know, culture. We've got terrific footprint evidence in, in the form of casts. There are some truly impressive casts out there. Not all of them, but, but some of them. We've got things like the Patterson-Gillen film, which I think is absolutely a, a, a film of a wood ape walking down a creek in Northern California. We have thousands of sightings. We have audio evidence. We have hair evidence. We have all kinds of evidence. And none of it, none of it has risen to the level of proof. None of it has even created uh, an interest at, at a level that would put someone in the field who could prove that it was real. So who wasn't already inclined to do it, like, you know, Daryl or me or other people in the North American Wood Ape Conservancy. So at this point, and I'm pretty sure that Daryl feels the same way, I don't want to bring out any evidence. I don't want any damn evidence. What I want personally, and what I think a lot of people in the group want, is we want to put a nail on the top of this thing and say it is done. We want proof. We're not looking to produce evidence. We're looking to produce proof. We may collect evidence along the way, but it's not what we're trying to do. Where is your footprint cast? We don't cast them anymore. Who cares? We've all You we've, know, you know what we do? You know, I've seen more tracks in there than I can count. Seth, and you know what we do when we see a footprint, when we see a trackway, we spit in it. <laughs> I, mean, I will I will sometimes I mean, take a picture of it. But yeah. I mean, I mean, what so your question is? Where's the proof? What do you mean by proof? Do you mean footprints? Do you mean you know? Right. Do you mean do you mean hair? Do you mean blood on rocks? Right. Uh, about blood you know, on rocks. What, what do you mean? Do you mean a body? Well, that's what that's what we're working for. And it's not it, you know, if it were easy, it would have been done a long time ago. Um, but I think, and that's the the, I think that that people. I think people think that the, the NAWAC is, is like a group like the BFRO or like any other group. And, and, I, don't, I, and I don't say that to, to disparage them, but at, at this point, I would say the group is, is, uh, is really focused on answering the question conclusively once and for all forever. And, and we don't want to, even though we still investigate sightings and we still publish them when, after the investigations are done, if we feel that they're worth publishing, mm -hmm. and, and we still do you know, all kinds of other outreach things and, and are involved in the community and that sort of thing, our, our purpose at this point is not to produce more evidence or to give people in the, in the community um, stuff to chew over. Um, the, the, the purpose that, that we're trying to, uh, you know, dedicate ourselves to is proving that this animal exists so that it and its habitat can't be protected. We're not trying to get a TV show. We're not trying to sell, you know, camp outs where there are spooky sounds in the woods. Uh, we are trying to prove that this animal is real. And it, it, that means that until we prove it, all we will have is stories. And you can either believe the stories or you cannot believe the stories. But that's where we are. Mm -hmm. 
And people like me don't care if you believe him or not. <laughs> no, he doesn't. <laughs> no. I don't care. You know? All right. That's and I, exactly but the thing is, note. but the thing is, I understand if you don't. I, I do understand if you don't. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, you if, know, if, so it's no big deal to me. I, you know? No. I, I, a reasonable pre, a reasonable person could could uh, could come to a number of conclusions after they hear what we say. And you know, I said this on the show last time to to you, Seth. I've, I've had a number of people say to me that 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 because I'm the one saying this, because I'm the one bringing this out, that, that you know they're willing to believe it or they're willing to uh, to accept that it may be true. And and that means a lot to me. It really does, just personally. But. Um, I, I could completely understand why someone would, would think that, that, uh, I, well, I can only imagine that they would think we're lying. I, I, I really can't believe that there's anything. And that's to, fine. To Whatever. It. Right. And that, and that is what it is because, because we all, don't have anything to refute that at this point. Right. So. All, all we have is our stories. Cause that's really all we're bringing out. That's well, cause what we're focused on is above and beyond, um, you know, quote unquote, Bigfoot evidence. Mm-hmm. All right. I think that's the note I want to end on. You guys uh, wrapped it up perfectly. So I got to thank you for coming on. And hopefully we can have you on again to talk uh, even more about this subject. Maybe even get to outside of the Area X and, and talk oh, that would about be great. Your, yeah. uh, your takes on the the field in general. Because I had questions written down I didn't even get to. So, But uh, <laughs> thanks for coming on, Daryl and Brian. Yeah, it's my pleasure. It's my pleasure, too. I really enjoy talking to you, Seth. All right. 